I was telling the earlier services that the hymns take me back to uh, a little country church in Jericho Springs, Missouri that I pastored for four years while I was going to college. And I have this image of Bernice on the piano <laughs> playing the, out of the hymn book. And we would always do the first, second, and last verse. We would never do the third verse. I <laughs> never knew why. And the church dog, Tramp, asleep on the floor. Precious times, precious times with precious people. Father, I thank you for these precious people who are here right now, that we could be together on this day to honor you and worship you, to know, Father, in our heart of hearts that you are our God, our Savior through your Son, Jesus, and that you are worthy of our praise, worthy of our lives, that the offering we bring of our life is what we come with to honor you. And so, Lord, take our lives and use them as only you can, as instruments for your goodness and your glory. And be with us as a church, Lord, as we continue to move forward, pursuing the things that you place on our hearts to pursue, to make a difference in our community and in our world. And I pray your blessing over other churches as well as they follow the lead of your spirit for their lives, that together we would be the one body of Christ, accomplishing your perfect will in this world. And so, Lord, we give you our lives today, fresh and new. Take them and now teach us through the inspiration of your word by your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's open to the book of James, the first chapter, James chapter 1 in your New Testaments. Last week, if you were here, we began a new series that I'm calling Kiss the Wave. It's a phrase that's taken from the writings of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. If you're not familiar with who Spurgeon was, he was known as the Prince of Preachers in the 1850s. He ministered in London, England through the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, his ministry was incredibly influential. He would preach an average of 13 times a week. He established Bible colleges, multiple churches, homes for unwed mothers, homes for prostitutes. Everywhere you went in the region of, of, of England, there was the footprint of the ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, incredibly successful. When he passed away in 1892, 60,000 people attended his service and another 100,000 people lined the streets of London, grieving the loss of this great man of God. Not only though did he accomplish much, he also suffered much. He was given to long and deep and dark periods of depression. His wife Susanna said at times that she so feared for his life that he would not come out of these depressions to preach another day. On top of that, he suffered from gout and painful arthritis. And then on top of that, after his twin sons were born, his wife Susanna became bedridden and was an invalid for the remaining 25 years of their marriage and her life. And so that's why Charles Haddon Spurgeon could write and say, I am no dry land sailor. He has felt the, wind, wind, uh, the billows uh, uh, blow against him and the waves crash against him. And he says, I speak from experience. And this is what he said. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Spurgeon understood something that scripture clearly teaches. He understood that waves are what draw us into a deeper spiritual walk with God. That when the waves crash against us, they are often unpleasant, difficult to navigate, and challenging to move through. But the wise sailor, the one who understands the movements and workings of God, understands that it is in those times when the waves are crashing that God speaks the clearest to us. And if we listen, he brings us into those deep 
wonderful places with him. In a day and age in which there is so much unsound theology that is presented across the airwaves, a theology that basically says if you come to Jesus, your life is going to be wonderful, you'll have no struggles, you'll have money in the bank, and all your needs taken care of. In the midst of that prosperity preaching and that theology, the Bible speaks so clearly in a different tone. And that's where the Lord's half-brother, James, says to us in James chapter 1, these penetrating words that he writes. He was one who knew about struggle and suffering. Any Christian living in the first century world in which James lived or Peter lived had a target on their back. The Roman Empire did not want to see Christianity survive or thrive. And so those who proclaimed the name of Christ, those who stood for their Christian faith and values and followed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, suffered much, many at the loss of their lives as well as their fortunes. And so James writes to encourage his readers. And he says this in verse 2 of chapter 1, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Words that are probably familiar to many of us here today. Notice that James does not say if troubles come, but he says when. It's a foregone conclusion. God reminds us that as we live in this broken world, we will experience hardships. We will experience difficulties. Troubles will come our way. The waves will crash and the winds will blow. We were reminded of that last week in Jesus' words in John 16, verse 33, when he said that in this world, you will have many trials and struggles. But James says, when these winds blow, when the waves crash, consider it an opportunity for great joy. It's an interesting word that James used, the word consider. It's used only one other time in Scripture. It's a word that means to contemplate. It's a word that means to think clearly through. In other words, when struggles come, we don't have the attitude, I'll just get through this. Rather, it's to come to a place in our heart and mind when we really embrace what is happening and we ask the difficult questions. Lord, what do I need to learn? What can you teach me? How can my character and my faith be sharpened as a result of what I'm experiencing? And James says that when you go through these trials, that as you endure, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. It's interesting that he alludes to the maturity of the Christian believer, and he says, you want to reach perfection? You want to come to the place where you have arrived as a believer? You will only get there through the struggles and through the trials. In fact, here's what I firmly believe. God cannot do anything great through you until he allows something to happen to you. And it's those times when the waves crash, if we're attentive to the work of God in our lives, that we will deepen our walk and our faith in Jesus Christ. Peter echoes the same sentiment in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, when he says, Dear brethren, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeals that are coming upon you as if some strange things were happening. This is to be expected, Peter says, for any of us who follow Jesus Christ. And so we, we hear that. We understand the theology of that, and we get it in our mind, but it's very difficult to travel the two-foot distance to our heart because it's not until we get it in our heart that our life begins to change. And so we struggle with the thought of trials and difficulties as followers of Jesus Christ. Sociologist Christian Smith says this is why many Christians leave the faith. He says they practice what he calls moralistic, therapeutic, deism. They worship a God who blesses people who are nice and good and fair, and he helps believers be happy and feel good about themselves. That's their understanding of who God is and what should be expected as a follower of God. And he goes on to say, when this naive and coldly utilitarian view of God crashes on the hard rocks of reality, we shouldn't be surprised to see people of any age 
walk away from the faith. We become disillusioned, don't we? We tend to think, well, it should be different if I'm giving my life to God and trying to live the good life that he's asked me to live. If I'm treating other people kindly and doing the right things, then surely I should have only prosperity and only good things happen. And when it doesn't, that naive view of God crashes, as he says, on the hard rocks of reality. We don't like waves. None of us here really likes to go through hardship and trials and struggles. None of us would be asking for that in our prayers. And the reason for that is because the waves that crash against us make us anxious. They bring a level of anxiety into our lives that is difficult for us to deal with. Symptoms of anxiety are usually described as fear and nervousness and irritability and sleeplessness, chest pains, breathing difficulties, digestive issues, headaches, insomnia, low energy, feeling overwhelmed. Am I talking to anybody this morning who maybe is experiencing some of those things or has experienced some of those things, is feeling maybe a little anxious about life because things are happening that are unpleasant, difficult to deal with? It's interesting, uh, psychologist Robert Leahy in his book, Anxiety Free, says the average child today exhibits the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient in the 1950s. Isn't that crazy? The average child today is experiencing levels of anxiety that were equal to those who had psychiatric issues in the 1950s. We could probably come up with a list of reasons as to why that's so. I believe social media plays into that bringing this level of expectation to such a height that kids struggle to meet that level. They see their friends succeeding. They see only the good things about their friends being posted, and they struggle with their self-esteem. Anxiety rises on and on and on. And we feel the waves of anxiety. We feel the waves of anxiety over the unknown. They're what I call the what-ifs of life. How many times do we do we think at least subconsciously, if not consciously, well, what, what if there's another terrorist attack upon our country? What if there's a shooting at my child's school or my grandchild's school? What, what if the economy collapses because we hear this about recession coming? What if I never find someone to spend my life with? What if I never get pregnant? Or what if I get pregnant? Or What if our marriage doesn't make it and and we fill ourselves with these levels of anxiety, these waves crash upon us dealing with the what ifs, the what ifs. And if it's not the unknown, it's the unlikely. We we, uh, were bombarded with news today at a very rapid fire pace, aren't we? Uh, You don't even need to turn on the TV. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, and you're connected to the internet, you got Bluetooth, it's going to come right to you. The minute that, that news is happening around the world, you're receiving it, and all the things that are going wrong are, are brought to your attention. And let's be honest, it's a phrase that was coined in 2017. It's the phrase fake news, and you can agree or disagree with that, but you have to be honest, there's a lot of fake news that's going around these days. I don't know if you remember when it was falsely reported that Charles Manson was going to be released on parole in Johnson City, Tennessee. You remember reading about that? I I read about that and I thought, well, that's strange. But it didn't bring a level of anxiety to me. You know why? I don't live in Johnson City, Tennessee, so it wasn't going to affect me. But the people who lived in Johnson City, Tennessee were all of a sudden walking around and everybody they saw looked like Charles Manson. They were freaking out. I don't know if you remember when it was reported that weapon-toting clowns were going on a murderous rampage. you remember that? And so for a few months, there was a lot of anxiety in our culture over dangerous clowns that were roaming the streets, which led to another fake news story that Congress had passed a law authorizing citizens to legally shoot and kill suspicious clowns which I personally think that's maybe not a bad idea because if you see a clown and the clown's not at the circus, you have to ask yourself, what are they doing out on the street? (laughs) It's all fake news. 
You remember the fake story of the elderly woman who was accused of training her 65 cats to steal from her neighbors? It wasn't true, but people all of a sudden, every time they saw a stray cat going across their yard, were thinking, this cat's here to steal from me. Fake news, but if we believe it, the, the wave of anxiety is, is real. And so the unknown, the, the unlikely, and then what I call the, the uncontrollable, it, it's feeling overwhelmed over the things that are out of your control. And let's be honest, so many of the things in our life are not in our control. And yet we worry about it. Waves of anxiety uh, swarm against us. And here's one thing I know. When the waves of anxiety crash against us, anxiety can cause us to give up. We, we feel absolutely overwhelmed, and so we think to ourselves, well, what's the sense of moving forward? How can I go on with this anxiety surrounding me? That's why for the next three weeks, if you'll hang in here with me, I want to talk with you about not giving up. Specifically, I'm going to talk with you, if you're married, about not giving up on your marriage. And I know some of your marriages are struggling. I know that. Some of you are at the point where you're, you're thinking about throwing in the towel. I'm going to encourage you to not give up on your marriage. I'm going to encourage you to not give up on yourself because there are people who are telling you that you cannot make it, that you are not worth it, that you are not gifted or talented enough, and that God says something very different. And I want to challenge you to not give up on God, that God is moving and working even though at times we cannot see or understand his movement. Someone has said that God is the great weaver. And he is weaving this tapestry of our lives, which is incredibly beautiful from his perspective looking down, but from ours looking up, it seems frayed and tattered. And so I'm going to talk with you about that. So what we need when the waves are crashing, or as Spurgeon said, when the roll of the billows and the rush of the wind pound upon us, here's what you need. We need a fresh dose of hope. We need hope. Hope is a belief in a positive outcome related to events and circumstances in one's life. The circumstances may not be what you want them to be. The events may not be what you would desire them to be. But hope brings you to a place where I think God is going to do something in the midst of this and there's going to be a positive outcome. The Hebrew writer in his letter, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, says this, Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. The hope that lies before us is the fact that there is a new heaven and a new earth that is going to be created, filled with the glory and goodness of God, and that we will dwell in that environment for eternity. This Life that we live now, you've heard me say it many times, is but the preschool of life. The real life begins the minute we take our last breath here and begin our first breath there. And we can't lose sight of that. So last week I said, waves will come. Of that we can be certain, but there is a day coming when waves will cease. John had a vision of this new heaven and this new world, and what he saw was a sea of glass for eternity. No more waves crashing against the shore, but smooth sailing for those who belong to God. And so we who have great confidence, we hold to the hope that lies before us. And, and the Hebrew writer goes on to say this, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. In the storm, when the waves are crashing, when the wind is blowing, Hope is that anchor that we hold on to that keeps us firm and steady and secure in the midst of the storm. It allows us to see into the very presence of God. What the Hebrew writer was referring to when he says it leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary was that when Jesus died, you might remember that the veil of the temple, a curtain which separated 
the holy of holies from the holy place. And the holy of holies is where God's presence was. And the high priest, once a year, only the high priest could go in through the curtain into the presence of God. But when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was torn in two, accessing entrance to God for all people. You don't need to go through a priest. You don't need to go through a pastor. Now, because of your trust, your faith, your hope in God, you are ushered into the very sanctuary of the living God. Isn't that cool? So we need that hope. And where there's no hope in the future, there's no power in the present. I love the message paraphrase of verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 6. It reads this way. We who have run for our very lives to God have every reason to grab the promised hope with both hands and never let go. It's an unbreakable spiritual lifeline reaching past all appearances right to the very presence of God. It's a lifeline. That's what hope is. And where there's no hope in the future, there's no power in the present. Without hope, we give up. You've heard me say it. It takes hope to cope. When you lose hope, you're losing life. During a uh, a, t- a time uh, in a little small town in Maine, a, a hydroelectric energy plant was going to be built. And since a dam had to be built across the river and the river ran through the middle of the town, the town was going to have to be evacuated. And, and so when the project was announced, the, the people who lived in that town were given months to arrange their affairs and, uh, and given months to prepare to relocate uh, their homes. And during the time before the construction even started, something interesting happened. All improvements to the town ceased. No painting was done. No repairs were made on buildings or roads or sidewalks. People no longer took care of their yards. They didn't maintain their homes. Day by day, the town got shabbier and shabbier. This was a long time before the construction of the dam began, a long time before the people actually were evacuated and abandoned the town, even though they hadn't moved away yet, they had lost all impetus to take care of the present because there was no hope for the future, right? Why why would I paint my house if six months from now it's gonna be underwater? Why would I care for my yard if six months from now it's going to be destroyed? Where there's no hope in the present, there's no power, hope for the future, there's no power in the present. People just give in to the crashing of the waves. And so when the waves of adversity are crashing, Peter once again reminds us. In 1 Peter 1 verse 6, he says, so be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. And we read that And we process it here, even though I have to endure a few waves for a little while. But you know what? To us, it doesn't seem like a little while. It seems like a lifetime. But perspective helps us to understand that our lives here are brief. Just a vapor, here today, gone tomorrow. But eternity is forever. Folks, listen, it's not the adversity we face in life that's important. What's important is the way that we react to adversity. We need hope when the waves are crashing, when you receive the diagnosis and the news isn't good, when your child goes sideways and you're praying that they'll return, when the marriage fails and a person walks out the door, when your finances are reversed and turned upside down and you've lost it all, listen, I guarantee you, you will not make it without hope. What we need is an understanding and realization that God is in the mix and it's not over as long as God is there. So we need to place our hope in God, but we also then need to do this. We need to trust in God. We need to trust that he has a plan. We need to trust that he is leading the way, that God is working in the midst of the wave. So if you're here today and the waves are crashing upon you, I want to challenge you to put your trust in the Lord. And as you put your trust in the Lord, you will be able to watch how he is going to strengthen you in the midst of the storm. The prophet Jeremiah said this, I love these words, Jeremiah 17, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank 
with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Those who trust in the Lord are like trees planted along a river bank. When I read that, I'm reminded of growing up in Southern California, we would spend a lot of time traveling to the Colorado River. Now, if you know the, the, the journey from Riverside, California, to let's say Needles, California, it, it's a pretty stark and desolate journey. You know, you go over Cajon Pass, drop into uh, Victorville, you hit Barstow, and, and from Barstow to Needles, it's the Mojave Desert. I mean, the only thing that's of interest is XXYYZZ Road. There, there's a road that's named that. Why, I, to this day, I still don't know. It is absolutely barren. It's like moonscape. But I can remember traveling to the Colorado River. I remember one specific trip. Jane, my wife, we were not married at the time. Her father was a journeyman electrician, and he was working in Needles, California. And so for the summer, she was living in Needles. I was in Riverside. I had a, a 1969 Volkswagen Black Bug. I had a Dalmatian named Briscoe. Jane had the brother of Briscoe. His name was Roscoe. And so being a good pet owner, I was taking Briscoe to see Roscoe one day to Needles in the Colorado River. And if you've ever driven that stretch of road, you'll know what I'm talking about. You drive and it's barren, it's barren, nothing but sand and rocks and scrub brush until finally you'll crest a hill and off in the distance you'll see this stretch of green. And you know that's the Colorado River. And as you approach, you see along the banks of the river this lush green vegetation, trees healthy and growing. And that's what I think of when I read the words of Jeremiah. Even though the landscape of your world, your environment, your life might seem bleak and dark and barren, even though you might feel as if you are in the desert right now, if you will put your trust in the Lord, you will be like that tree planted by the Colorado River. You will thrive because your roots run deep into the source of life, and that's God Almighty. When the waves come, put your hope and your trust in God, and then the last thing you do is you transfer then your fears and worries and anxiety to God. And this is important. There, there's a verse in your Bible and mine. It's a very popular verse. It's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, which reads, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. Some of your translations may read, Cast all of your cares upon God because he cares for you. So when you hear the word cast, what do, you, what do you think? Think fishing. Well, I'm going to cast my cares out into this pond and, and I'm going to leave them with God. Well, that imagery doesn't work for me because if you're fishing, when you cast, what do you do? You reel back in what you have casted. Peter wasn't using a word to denote fishing. Peter was using a word that simply meant to transfer the weight. When the waves are crashing, maybe somebody in good meaning Christian has told you, well, just let go of your cares and let God. Well, that sounds great. But it's like I'm, I, I'm, I'm bench pressing a 300 pound bell bar of, of anxiety and fear. And, I, and somebody says, well, just let go. How's that going to work for you? Not very good. Peter isn't talking about letting go. Peter is talking about transferring the weight. Because what God wants to do is he wants to take the weight of your fears, your anxieties, your worries, as those waves crash upon you. And he says, listen, don't care and put them on my back. If you're a parent, you can relate to this. When my kids were little, I have three daughters, when my kids were little, we would take a trip somewhere and 
we would drive long distance during the day. The kids would be tired. We'd roll into some town at night, get a motel for the evening, maybe continue traveling the next day. And oftentimes, my children were just exhausted by the time we got to the motel. And I can remember opening the, the door to the car and getting luggage out and you know, starting to, to make a trip into the room. And I'd say to the kids, come on, kids, let's go. And they would say, Dad, I'm tired. And I'd go back and I'd grab one by the hand and I'd say, come on. And they'd just be dragging behind me and they'd say, Dad, I'm so tired. Will you carry me? So what do you do? You reach down and you pick up your kid and you transfer their weight to you. And you carry them into the room. That's what God wants us to understand when he says to cast your cares. I want you to know that I want to carry you. I don't want you to have to stumble up the stairs by yourself. I I want to carry you. I I want to take these worries and concerns and I want to carry them for you. What waves are crashing on you today? When we started this series last week, I told you, you can't run from the wave. You've got to go through the wave. And if you've spent any time at the ocean, maybe you can understand what I'm going to say here. Growing up in Southern California, surfing, body boarding, whatever it might have been, you learn real quick to practice what is called a duck dive. Anybody familiar with that term? A duck dive. In other words, you're paddling on your surfboard and you're going out because you want to catch some of the bigger waves, but to get to the big waves, you've got to go through some smaller waves, and so you don't go over the wave. When the wave is approaching, you put your weight on your surfboard, and you push down, and you dive through the wave. That's called a duck dive. To get to where you need to be, to embrace the wave you want to ride, you've got to do a duck dive. That's what God's calling us to do. The waves are going to come. They're not going to stop until we get to heaven. The the waves are going to crash against us, but you push through the wave. You, You go through the wave. You kiss the wave by putting your hope in God, by putting your trust in the Lord, by transferring the weight of your fears and anxiety to Him. Let Him carry it because He doesn't want you to have to. And you push through. I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages because I wouldn't experience the rock of ages in the way that I know the rock of ages without the wave crashing against me. So kiss the wave. Kiss the wave of anxiety because it's an opportunity for you to experience his peace, a peace that surpasses all human comprehension. How are you going to understand that level of peace unless you've kissed the wave? Kiss the wave of loneliness because it's an opportunity for you to experience His presence. Kiss the wave of weakness because it's an opportunity for you to experience His strength that you'll understand that His strength is made possible through your weakness. Kiss the wave of pain because it's an opportunity for you to discover his purpose in your pain. That he will open up doors for you to share through your pain that he never would have opened without it. Again, God wants to do something through you, but he can't accomplish that until he does something to you. Kiss the wave of shame because it's an opportunity to experience God's grace that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more and that you cannot escape the incredible, marvelous grace of God. Kiss the wave of darkness because it's an opportunity to discover his light that shines in the midst of the darkness. Kiss the wave. I've learned to do that. I pray that you will too because it throws us against the rock of ages. Let's pray. Father, thank you. 
Thank you for the struggles and trials of life because in those struggles and trials, we see your goodness and your glory and your power in ways that are just incredible. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters here today as the waves crash against them. Oh God, give them the strength and faith to place their hope and trust in you and to transfer the weight of their fears and anxieties to your shoulders because you care so deeply for them. Bless us in this spiritual journey called life to those deeper places with you as we kiss the wave of adversities. In Jesus' name, amen. There's nothing your love can do And so I kiss the wave